This tutorial is on earthquakes. The first aim is to link the structure of our Earth to the cause of earthquakes, then compare P waves and S waves, two types of waves emitted by earthquakes, and then interpret data from seismometers. These are pieces of equipment that detect tremors and display them graphically. Being destructive is no easy task. It can take weeks of strategic planning, choosing where to plant your explosives to make sure you bring a building down. Well, that's if you're human anyway. If you're the Earth, you can do that job in a few seconds. The downside is, earthquakes don't discriminate. They will take down everything in their path if the force is strong enough. Depending on where you're geographically located, for example, if you live near a plate boundary, your country will be more susceptible to attacks by earthquakes. This has led to engineers coming up with some pretty innovative solutions to such a dramatic problem. For example, in Japan, where they're very susceptible to earthquakes, some buildings have huge sliding weights fitted on top. When an earthquake tremor pushes the building one way, the weight slides to the other side to balance it out. And when the tremor moves the building another way, once again the weight moves to the opposing end to balance it out, giving the building stability. This is an example of where drastic problems lead to drastic measures. But to understand earthquakes, we must first understand the structure of our Earth. So here is our blue planet, the planet Earth. And the Earth has a diameter of around 12,000 kilometers. From space, we can only see the crust of our Earth, and some of the crust is buried underneath oceans. The crust itself is fractured. It's very thin layer, only varying between 5 kilometers to about 50 kilometers deep, depending on whether you're standing in a valley or on top of a mountain. The fractured crust is divided into large moving masses of rock we call plates. These plates float upon uh, the mantle. The mantle is a very slowly moving solid underneath, a bit like crackers resting on hot treacle. Now we know these plates move, and the evidence from this largely comes from earthquakes and volcanoes. Wherever earthquakes are frequent, you can expect you live somewhere on a plate boundary. This also explains why certain regions, you don't really get many earthquakes. For example, on our country in the UK, we really don't get earthquakes, or none to worry about anyway. So earthquakes and volcanoes are found on plate boundaries. But for us to understand that the Earth is not a static system, it's always in a state of change, we need to look inside the Earth. So we need to take a cross-section through the Earth. Once we do that, we can see that the Earth is made from distinct layers. The innermost layer is referred to as the inner core. Due to the extreme pressure it's under, it acts like a solid. And just outside that, we have the outer core, which is under less pressure, so acts more like a liquid. The inner core and outer core are made from iron and nickel, two magnetic metals, which is why our Earth has a magnetic field around it. Then, most of the Earth's structure is composed of the mantle. The mantle acts like a very slowly moving solid. The heat from the mantle is generated through the process of radioactive decay as unstable elements decompose under the Earth's crust. The thin outer layer is known as the crust. This is where we live. As I said, the Earth's crust is fractured. It's split up, divided into giant moving plates. And these plates, as I said, can move. But what causes them to move? We get rotating currents of heat known as convection currents which move the masses of rock that rest upon the mantle. These convection currents are responsible for moving the plates and driving the rock cycle. And knowing that convection currents drive the rock cycle will really help you in exams because it comes up a lot. So just a quick summary of the key facts. The crust is 5 to 50 kilometers deep and it's the outer layer of the earth. The mantle acts as a slowly moving solid. Radioactive decay keeps it hot. There are convection currents in the mantle that move the plates. The core is hottest, the outer part is referred to as liquid, and the inner a solid. The core is iron and nickel, which makes it magnetic, and therefore gives the Earth a magnetic field. Earthquakes are a direct consequence of moving plates. So you can imagine two giant land masses or two plates come close to each other and get stuck due to friction. Over time, the convection currents are moving them in opposite directions, but they can't move because they're stuck. Then suddenly, they slip, and that's what causes an earthquake. Scientists never know exactly how much force is required to create the slip, so we never know how long before an earthquake occurs. 
We can look at rocks in, in our earth and see if they're under a particular strain which might indicate an earthquake, but generally speaking, it's pretty much impossible to predict accurately when an earthquake happens. So it's often common practice when a scientist is trying to work out a solution to a problem that they build a model. In exams, they quite regularly throw different models at you for you to interpret. In every model, there'll be something that represents movable plates and convection currents, the currents that provide the force that move these plates. Your job is to work out which bit relates to what. So here's one explanation of a specific model. Here we have a tank of water. We are heating the water with a Bunsen burner and there are corks floating on the water. As we heat the water, we cause convection currents to occur within the water and this in turn moves the corks. And this simulates plate tectonics. In this model, the Bunsen burner represents the heat generated from the Earth's core. The water represents the mantle or the magma with the convection currents moving the magma slowly like rotary belts or conveyor belts. And the corks obviously represent the movable plates. I've used a colour key so you can see what matches with what. Now, you could replace certain components of this model. For example, the water could be treacle, the corks could be bits of floating biscuits on that treacle. But the principle is always the same. You produce convection currents within the liquidy part and it moves the solid plates resting on the liquidy part. So this model represents the cause of plate movement. In other words, we can see how convection currents move plates. But here we have a different model which is designed to really teach us one specific thing. In this model, we have a brick with its rough surface and we have some sandpaper which is resting beneath it, which is supported on a workbench. The brick is attached to a cord which feeds through a pulley and then we attach weights onto the end of that cord. Now currently, there's too much friction between the sandpaper and the brick for the brick to move. So in order to move the brick, we need to apply a greater force on that brick. So let's start off by adding another weight. Still no movement, and now let's add a third weight. You can see suddenly the brick moves. So in this model, the brick and the sandpaper represent two plates which are making contact with each other, and the masses hanging off this pulley represent the force which the convection currents apply to the plates. In other words, the force that these exert on the plates. So what does this experiment teach us? Nothing conclusive, or rather, there's no pattern to spot. Every time you repeat this experiment, you'll require a different force to move the brick. So a different force is needed each time. So this tells us one thing. Earthquakes are really difficult to predict. In fact, impossible to predict accurately. Now, predicting when the next earthquake is due for arrival is incredibly important because obviously earthquakes can lead to mass loss of life and property destruction, so it would hugely benefit us to have an accurate predicting method. Another thing we can do is look at the historic pattern of certain earthquakes and volcanic events. For example, some earthquakes happen fairly regularly, so we can use that previous pattern to predict future patterns. Again, it's not ideal because nothing's set in stone. As you can see, different forces needed each time. And that is how you link the structure of our Earth to the cause of earthquakes. So as we've seen, earthquakes occur when plates get stuck to each other, build up force and then slip. Upon doing so, the origin of the earthquake, the point at which the earthquake occurs beneath the ground, releases two types of shock waves. The first type of shock wave is called a P wave. They're called P waves because they are the first wave, the primary wave that's released from an earthquake's origin. You can also think of them as P for push. And that's because they are longitudinal waves. In other words, as the energy moves forward, particles are pushed back and forth. P waves are the fastest of the two shock waves. They produce infrasound that can be detected by animals, if you saw the tutorial on infrasound and ultrasound. And most importantly, they move through solids and liquids. So here you can see a cross-section of our Earth. We've got the relatively solid mantle and the relatively liquid outer core. This is the origin point of the earthquake, and you can see the waves travel throughout the Earth. Nothing stops them. The second type of wave to be released is called an S wave. S is for secondary, so that will help you remember the second wave that's released. And you can think of S for shake. One, because the S wave does the damage. And two, because it's a transverse wave. Unlike P waves and sound waves, which are longitudinal, 
S waves are like light waves, they are transverse. As the energy moves forward, they disturb particles by moving them up and down. In other words, they shake them up. So, S waves are transverse, they move slower, and they only move through solids. They cannot move through liquids. For this reason, we get a different pattern of shock waves through our Earth. You'll notice no problem getting through the relatively solid mantle, but they cannot travel through liquids, such as our outer core. So remember, P waves are released first, they're faster, they're longitudinal, and they move through solids and liquids. S waves are released second, they are transverse, they are slower, and move through solids only. Use the S to help you. Remember, S for secondary, S for shake, transverse, S for solids only. One way in which our understanding of P waves and S waves is useful is we know that the greater the time delay between the arrival of the P wave and S wave, the further away the earthquake origin is. We use seismometers, which we place all over the Earth's surface to graphically record the arrival of each shock wave. I'm sure you've seen these before in films. Basically, it's just a hanging needle over some graph paper. And what happens as they detect a tremor, they start to draw a line. And you can see they look a bit like this. This section here is our P wave. Then after a short delay, we have our S wave over here. This data can help us locate the origin of an earthquake, but I'll go on to that in the next section. However, believe it or not, a lot of good things have come out of earthquakes as well, or our studying of earthquakes. By placing seismometers all around the Earth's surface, we can detect where earthquake shock waves end up in relation to where they started off their origin. Now, one thing you may notice is the lines aren't straight, they are curved. This is true for P waves and S waves. Now, if you remember, if a wave curves or bends, you should be thinking about the principle of refraction. What causes a wave to refract? Well, gradual changes in speed cause this gradual curving. What causes the change in speed? Well, there must be gradual changes in density. In other words, the materials must change as the wave travels through the Earth. Of course, not all the waves actually just get refracted. Some get reflected and rebounded as well. Sometimes a wave experiences a huge kink. This is a sudden change in speed due to a significant change in density. For example, when the wave travels from the outer core to the mantle, from liquid to solid. And in some regions, you'll detect no waves whatsoever. Now, believe it or not, seismologists use this data to study reflection and refraction patterns to determine our Earth's structure. Yet, yeah, we certainly don't know we have a core because we've been that far down there. We can barely scratch the surface of our Earth. It's just far too hot and there's too much pressure to send any machinery down there hoping it will make it without breaking and melting. So scientists can study materials in a lab and see how waves travel through them and how they bend and refract. And we can compare the refraction patterns of known materials to how waves refract through the Earth in terms of where they start and where they end up. So by knowing the point where they started and where they ended up, we know how much bending occurred and therefore we can estimate what materials they must have travelled through. I'm oversimplifying, but as long as you understand the basic principle. So remember, because waves bend, and because sometimes they experience dramatic kinks, and because sometimes no waves are detected at all, we put this all together to determine the structure of our Earth and estimate the materials it's made from. And that is how we compare P waves and S waves. Now, in my opinion, some of the most popular and toughest exam questions you get are on earthquakes, specifically on interpreting seismograph data. So I'm going to pull together everything I've learned to help you understand some of the more challenging questions you get. Firstly, a few key definitions. Remember, the origin is where the earthquake starts, and the epicenter is the place vertically above the origin on the Earth's surface. Epi means surface. So by reading seismometer data, scientists are trying to find out the location of an earthquake's epicenter. Now remember, P waves move faster than S waves, and also P waves are less damaging. So imagine you've got three stations, each with their own seismometer, at a certain distances from the epicenter of an earthquake. So an earthquake occurs and the P waves and S waves are released simultaneously, just like lightning and thunder. But P waves being faster will start to gain a lead on the S waves. And as we move forward, we can see that the delay time between the arrival of the P wave and S wave becomes more and more exaggerated as the P wave has more time to advance or separate itself from the S wave. 
For this reason, the further away a station is from the epicenter, the greater the time delay between the arrival of the P wave and the arrival of the S wave. You can see the delay times getting greater the further away a station is. This is exactly the same principle as observing a thunderstorm. The further you are from the storm, the bigger the time delay between you seeing the flash of lightning and hearing the sound of thunder. So a seismometer will record something very similar to this. The graph will have time along the bottom, and the lines represent when the shock waves are received. So at 30 seconds, nothing's received, 35 seconds, nothing. Then at 40 seconds, we have our P wave, which is smaller in size and scale than our S wave, then nothing for a bit. Then suddenly at 60 seconds, we have our larger S wave, and then nothing. So this station shows a delay of 20 seconds between the arrival of the P wave at this point and the arrival of the S wave at this point. So now we can read a seismograph, you can see the other station's data as well. You can see station 2, which is further away from the epicenter, there's a greater delay between 45 seconds and 75 seconds gives us a delay time of 30 seconds. Then station 3, which is further away still, has a delay time of 35 seconds because 50 seconds is the arrival of the P wave and 85 seconds is the arrival of the S wave. What this tells us also is that these stations are spaced out as so. Here's the first station, here's the second station, but the third station must be proportionately a bit closer to the second station. That's because the time difference is less. In other words, difference of 10 seconds here, but only five seconds here. If they all had a time delay of 10 seconds, then we could assume that these stations are equally spaced out. Look out for that point. I've seen it come up once in an exam. In other words, time delay is proportional to distance of station from the epicenter. So from here on in, we're going into higher territory. Remember, seismologists use the time delay to calculate the distance or radius of the epicenter from each seismograph. In an exam, they might ask you to calculate the distance of a station from the epicenter using one of two methods. Firstly, you might have to perform a mathematical calculation where you'll have to work out the time delay by working out the distance using a graph, so distance between this point and this point, and then multiply it by a figure they will give you. This is a figure that represents speed of the wave to work out the distance of the station from the epicenter. That's pretty easy because you just plug in the figures. There's only one way you can do it. Just remember, multiply the time delay by the figure they give you. They'll probably even give you the formula because it's not one of the formulas you get on the front sheet. Secondly is the graphical method. This confused a lot of students when it came up in an exam a few years back. Let's say you're trying to work out the distance of station Q from the epicenter of an earthquake. And the piece of information you're given is that the delay between the P wave and the S wave was 20 seconds. How would you use this graph to estimate the distance? You'd have to find a two points on the graph which in between there's a time delay of 20 seconds. So in other words, this point here and this point here. So you'd keep measuring the distances between these two lines until you find one which is equivalent to 20 seconds, and then you just read off the graph to find the distance. So once seismologists have worked out the distance of different stations from the epicenter of an earthquake, and by distance I do mean radius, they can then triangulate the data to work out the exact location of the epicenter. So let's look at station one first, which is the green one over here. Now we know the earthquake has occurred somewhere in this area, but we're not sure exactly where. But either using the graphical method or the formula method, which I just showed you. So now we know the distance of the epicenter from the station. In other words, the radius of this circle. So we know how far away the earthquake occurred from the station, but we don't know in which direction it occurred. To work out the direction, we have to triangulate. So we do exactly the same for the other stations. Now we'll look at station two. Notice how this station has a bigger radius, and that's because it's further away from the epicenter. So in other words, the time delay would have been greater. So now we know that the earthquake occurred somewhere around here, but we don't know where exactly. So we triangulate with station three. And this station being further away still has a bigger radius because of the greater time delay. Now using these three stations, we can pinpoint the exact location of the epicenter. 
So if you ever have to describe this process in an exam, just use this language. Seismologists use the time delay to calculate the distance or radius of the epicenter from each seismograph. Then they triangulate the data to work out the location of the epicenter. Quite a lot to take in there, so feel free to look at it again if you need to. And that's how we interpret data from seismometers.